And thank you very much, Dr. Eaton and Dr. Walk, for your very kind invitation to attend the symposium. It's been absolutely wonderful. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to tell you about um, our experience with injectable collagenase, which many of you may have heard of uh, for the treatment of Dupuytrens, and the results of uh, our pivotal phase three nationwide trials called the CORD-1 study. We were absolutely thrilled to have this published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in uh, September 2009, and I believe you all have a copy of that in uh, the carry bags that were handed out. And so I'm having the same difficulties. It's uh, on the side? Yes. Back up. There it goes. So I do have disclosures. Um, Dr. Hurst and I are research investigators for this CORD-1 clinical trial and consultants for Xilium Pharmaceuticals. And we do hold very partial royalty rights um, from a company called Biospecific Technologies. And so collagenase injection as a treatment option for Dupuytrens is now approved, we're happy to say, by the US Food and Drug Administration. It's uh, registered as Zioflex. Our previous FDA regulated phase two and single center phase three trials have showed clear merit for this in injection therapy to safely correct joint contractors, contractures to zero to five degrees of normal extension in most cases. That's the very high bar that we set for ourselves initially with the US um, Food and Drug Administration. And uh, maybe in hindsight, uh, that was too high a bar, but that's the bar that we set for all of phase two and all of phase three. So the present FDA regulated study is phase three. It's termed the collagenase option for reduction of Dupuytrens, or the CORD study. And it's randomized, double blind, placebo controlled, and with an open label extension, that means patients can go further, and I'll explain that with known drug. And it's to investigate the efficacy and safety of the injection in a much, much larger uh, patient population. Uh, 16 centers, we're happy to say, participated across the United States of America. Um, the CORD-2 study, which I won't report on, had five centers in Australia. And so when you do studies like this, I think you have to design them um, critically and with good intent and with good thinking. And this is the CORD-1 study design. We enroll patients with contractures of the MP between 20 and 100. And of the PIP, between 20 and 80, or of both of those joints. And these were stratified by severity of equal to less than 50 for the MP, or equal to less than 40 for the PIP. Now, randomization versus the placebo was in favor of the drug by a ratio of two to one. You might say, well, why did we do that? Because we did the one-to-ones uh, and the open labels prior in our phase two work. The dose that we use is 0.58 milligrams. And there was a lot of developmental work to arrive at that dose, dose response studies in patients, for example. So the total volume that we inject is very small. Into the cord, near an MP joint, the volume is 0.25. Into the cord, near a PIP joint, is 0.20. Now, a cord can be injected three times, and we leave 30 days between injections. So day 90 was um, the end of the double-blind study, but these patients were followed out to one year, and indeed, 
will be followed on an annual basis out to five years, and those studies are ongoing. So the open label option was for treatment failure or other joint contractures of the same or uh, other hand, and five of these injections were allowed. So the total that uh, a patient could get conceivably uh, was eight if they indeed were randomized to the drug in the double blind. These patients are also followed for a year. Now this is a nice little uh, video. This is what we do uh, with patients the day after an injection. It's a simple manipulation and extension. I don't think that the uh, sound is gonna work, but it starts with a little cartoon, and then you'll see the patient's hand. So there's your injection into a cord, and that's cord rupture. And that's what we define as clinical success. There's immediate full flexion and extension uh, the day after. And unfortunately, the sound doesn't work, and the audible sound of that rupture is uh, quite impressive, we think. So uh, again, when you do clinical trials, you've got to define, okay, this is the way I'm going to do it, but how am I going to measure whether this is successful or not? And we call them primary endpoints. And as I said, ours was quite rigorous. The primary endpoint, or clinical success, was the reduction in contracture to zero to five degrees of normal extension in what we term the primary joint or the first joint treated 30 days after a last injection. And then we have all these secondary endpoints, for example, uh, you know, greater or equal to 50% reduction, and I'll be showing you these results. So we, of course, define you know, who we're treating. Ms. Larson did a great clinical trial because it's sort of in this mold of define what you're going to do and then critically assess uh, how you're going to do it and the results that you obtain. Our patient uh, population uh, was quite similar to uh, the literature. Uh, mean age is about 63 years, 80% male, and uh, this is our intent to treat population, 306 uh, primary joints were analyzed for efficacy, and 203 got the drug, 103 received placebo, and here you can see uh, the finger distribution. We also had a very high number of um, little fingers in our data set. And so, okay, how does this work? Overall, we showed that the results of collagenase injection was that 64% of all the joints, all the primary joints, reached that very critical zero to five degrees of normal extension 30 days after uh, injection. 85% achieved an equal to or greater than 50% contracture reduction for a mean reduction of 79%. So let's dissect this just a little bit. So if we look at the contractures by joint type, 77% of the MPs and 40% of the PIPs reach this straight finger clinical success status compared to the placebo. So okay. What does that mean? If we look further at the baseline severity and the response to the collagenase injection, it's apparent that the MP joints had a good response, as did the less severe um, PIP joints. But the more severe, and we define more severe as, as greater than 40, not greater than um, 60. Uh, the more severe PIP joints were less responsive. So joints that had equal to or greater than 50% contracture reduction, again by joint type, was 94% for the MP joints and 
67 for PIP joints. I think this next slide is, well, I have, I guess we have some examples of very severe contractures of ring finger and after and before and after. And in your printout, I can assure you that we don't turn fingers blue. If you look down at your programs, that's just a little uh, publication error. So, safety. This would not be FDA approved if uh, it wasn't safe as well as effective. The adverse events are mild to moderate and reserve, uh, resolved without intervention in a median of, of 10 days. Uh, as ex we would expect, the collagenase treated patients had more injection and finger manipulation related events. And the most common are, of these are highlighted um, in the yellow. And they were edema, contusion, injection site hemorrhage, and pain. Some of these are redundant terms as you sort of go down the list on this very busy slide, but that's because of the nature of how we need to report to the, the Food and Drug Administration. <coughs> There were three serious adverse events in this trial, two tendon ruptures, and one complex regional pain syndrome. There were no vessel or nerve injuries, and quite importantly, no systemic immune events. Uh, apparently a slide did not show, um, because they may have reverted to another um, version of this talk, but, um, of the successful joints, the mean number of injections that we gave in this study was 1.5. I had a graph to show, but I think that got lost in the sauce. So, in summary, our uh, rigorous primary endpoint of near or normal extension was achieved in the majority of patients who received collagenase treatment an even larger majority uh, achieved fifth, greater than 50% contracture reduction. Again, the mean was 1.5 injections. We absolutely thank the CORD-1 investigators around the nation, and indeed around the world, who are uh, still conducting studies, for example, in, in Australia and European nations. Uh, without their huge efforts, um, studies like this, as we all keep saying, uh, cooperation, cooperation, studies like this would not be possible. And so, I hope this works. I believe it will only be by well-conducted, con uh, prospective, and if you can, controlled clinical trials and of course basic science work, that we may advance to new forms of treatment for the benefit of our patients. And perhaps Dr. Houston is uh, maybe smiling down upon us because as of today, at least in the United States, um, there is a non-surgical treatment for this insidious disease. Does it cure it? No, I think. Uh, the cooperation of the basic scientists and the surgeons, clinicians, is mo utmost in, in solving that very difficult problem. And so this is where I'm from. We live in cubes on Long Island, and it's been my pleasure to address you today. Thank you.